Yeah, so welcome uh, for the fourth time, I suppose, um, for our last uh, panel session of, of this workshop, um, Understanding and Automating Counterspeech. Um, we've had three really interesting sessions so far, and I'm, I'm sure that this one is just going to be as interesting. Um, where we, we get some new perspectives, um, a few different disciplines that we haven't heard from um, so far. Um, I suppose most people at this point have been around um, for a few sessions already, but I'm just going to say it again. So uh, we are recording this, so if you don't want to be seen, um, please feel free to, of course, uh, turn your camera off. Um, the recording will let, later on be available on the CRASH website. Um, if you want to ask a question, feel free to type them in the chat already um, as the participants are talking. Um, just as soon as you have a question, just type it in the chat. Or if you want to ask a question in person, then feel free to raise your hand. So if you go on the reactions button, then you get the option at the very bottom um, that you can raise your hand and then I will know and I will ask you um, or invite you to ask a question. I hope I'm not forgetting anything. Um, right, also there is captioning available. So um, that should also be, you should also be able to see that. You can activate captioning, but just be aware that this is done by Zoom. So I, I can't take responsibility for, for everything being perfectly correct, but um, yeah, just so that you are aware. Um, okay, otherwise I think we can start with our um, session and it's going to be similar to the session so far. So I'm going to introduce our panelists or participants first um, and then I'm going to ask you all to provide um, a brief definition of counter speech. How do you define counter speech and how does your specific background, the field that you work in kind of shape your understanding of counter speech? Um, and after that, we will have two shorter presentations, one by Kathy and one by Joshua. And then we will hopefully have plenty of time to, um, to discuss um, with all the other participants, of course, and also um, invite questions from the audience. All right, um, if it's okay, I'm gonna start with Kathy. Um, so uh, Kathy is the Director of Research at the Dangerous Speech Project, um, which she joined in September of 2017. Um, she holds a PhD in anthropology from the University of Connecticut where her research examined the impact of human rights education on political beliefs and behavior in Ghana. Her current research at the Dangerous Speech Project focuses on global responses to dangerous and hateful speech, as well as the process of identity formation among those who choose to respond to such speech. And she also coordinates the Dangerous Speech Project's Global Research Fellowship. Um, so I think um, I'm going to adopt Marcus's method and then ask Kathy straight away uh, for your definition or your understanding of counter speech. Sure, thank you. Um, I've been smiling when hearing that question all day because we are currently in the process of kind of tweaking our definition that we've used at the at the DSP um, to make it kind of more inclusive in some ways and also not make it so wide that kind of everything gets in, right? Uh, the definition I think that we're kind of working with right now is any reply, any direct reply or response to hateful or harmful speech which seeks to undermine it. Um, and we've done a lot of thinking kind of about uh, are these, you know, replies and responses that are directed at the speaker. We certainly know it's more than just the speaker, right? It could also be this larger audience. So we feel like that should be part of kind of our understanding. Um, and this definition is really influenced by, by two aspects of kind of my work and my background. 
uh, one, not just my work, obviously, uh, the work of the Dangerous Speech Project in thinking about what constitutes speech, right? So we often use the word speech, but we're referring to this larger um, kind of group of messages we're thinking about. Um, images, obviously, can other visual representations, thinking about emojis right now that can be responses, right? Um, in the same way that those kinds of things can be dangerous speech, they can also be counter speech. And then I think also as an anthropologist, I'm often thinking about how does this definition kind of line up with the things that the counter speakers who I, who I work with and speak and observe that they do. And some of these things that we're seeing um, in that research have challenged our definition a little bit, especially when thinking about this issue of what constitutes direct and, and the idea of relational counter speech that we heard uh, in a few sessions, um, last session and the session before. So maybe that's something we can come back to later if we are in need of, in need of discussion questions. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, already the first session has shown that there are some diverging views on how we actually should uh, view counter speech and what, what counts as counter speech, I guess. Um, all right. Um, I'm going to continue with Nadine Strossen. Um, Nadine is a professor at the New York Law School and a leading expert in constitutional law and human rights. She was also the first woman national president of the American Civil Liberties Union, where she served from 1991 to, 90, uh, to 2008. Sorry. Um, she is a frequent speaker on constitutional and civil, li civil liberties issues, and her media appearances include programs like 60 Minutes, Today, The Today Show, The Daily Show, Good Morning America, and other news programs such as CNN, C-SPAN, Fox, mm -hmm. and Al Jazeera. And she's also been, or she's appeared in, in international programs in Australia, Britain, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. Um, in her most recent book, um, which is called Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech and Not Censorship, she cites evidence from different countries to show why hate speech laws are ineffective and advocates for the application of vigorous counter speech and activism as best way to resist hate. I hope I summed that up correctly. Um, yeah, Nadine, um, would you like to give us your definition of counter speech? Thank you so much, Stephanie. I uh, have been on since 6 a.m. my time and paying attention with great interest to these uh, fascinating proceedings. And I'd like to thank you and all of the people who organized it and have participated in it. I will associate myself with the much broader concepts of counter speech that some others have advocated, recognizing, however, that for different purposes, different definitions make sense. So I completely understood when um, our, our very first speaker, Amalia, uh, explained that for her sociological research, it really made sense to have a much narrower definition of counter speech than one might have if one were an activist. And that's one of my really important takeaways uh, from the proceedings today. Uh, as an activist and somebody who is attentive to not only US law, but international law about free speech, I have, I think, a really broad concept of counter speech and also other counter measures that must be taken into account under both US law and United Nations law, as well as the law of many other countries, um, because of a basic principle that all of those legal systems share, which is you may only censor speech as a last resort if there is no less speech restrictive alternative that could be as effective encountering the potential harm of the speech. So uh, I would lump into that not only every kind of speech or expression that might counter any kind of potentially harmful impact of the speech, I would also look at non-speech measures such as anti-discrimination laws or laws against hate crimes and bias crimes. And I realize that's very far afield from the discussion here, but I did wanna provide that, that contextual benchmark. Um, 
I also have been taking notes as we've gone through, and I, I made notes of three different kinds of counter speech that to the best of my uh, listening capability, I didn't hear anybody else address. So I wanted to, to flag those uh, to add to the categories that have already been discussed. Um, one is what I would call uh, teaching habits of resilience to those who are targeted or likely to be targeted by hate speech. Uh, many cognitive psychologists and social psychologists and other experts in the you know, brain sciences and, and mental health and so forth say that there is education, including proactive education, that can help all of us not to allow ourselves to be demeaned and stigmatized by hateful speech or to be triggered by it into violence. So to me, that's a very important kind of uh, proactive general counter speech. The other two examples that I thought of were prompted when I heard the very interesting remarks by um, Lynn and by Ray in, in the last session. Um, Lynn talked about, uh, and I think somebody else earlier had adverted to studies that people are irrational and they're not going to respond positively to rational analysis and facts and data and evidence that if anything that will just make them uh, entrench them even more in their hateful, discriminatory, ignorant ideas. Uh, but that suggests, and, and, and certain organizations that work with redeeming hate mongers have, have, have approached this through uh, not rational means, but through bonding and by building trusting relationships. They say this is, a, and responding to some of the psychological and emotional needs on the part of the hate mongers. Um, I think it was Lynn also referred to Megan Phelps Roper as an example of somebody who has documented her bonding experience through Twitter and other, you know, the founders of an organization called Life After Hate have done the same thing. Uh, Lynn also referred to uh, the notion of habits of thought. And I would include that as a third kind of very general proactive um, counter speech strategy, helping all of us to overcome our cognitive biases. And that can help us um, more rationally deal with not only hate speech, but also extremist speech and disinformation and other kinds of potentially damaging speech. Thank you. Thank you. That that was very useful. And I think we can come back to some of these points later in the discussion. Um, I'm going to continue with Kenneth Stern. Um, Kenneth uh, is the director of the Bard Center for the Study of Hate. He's an award winning author and attorney, and he was the German. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> He was the American Jewish Committee's expert on anti-Semitism for 25 years. Um, he was also the lead drafter of the working definition of anti-Semitism, which is now adopted by the US Department of State. His articles and book reviews have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, the Forward, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, and elsewhere. He has argued before the United States Supreme Court, testified before Congress, was an invited presenter at the White House Conference on Hate Crimes and served as a member of the US delegation to the Stockholm Forum on Combating Intolerance. In his newest book, The Conflict Over the Conflict, he examines why the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has become such a toxic and divisive issue on university campuses and what can be done about that. He believes that we need to better understand hatred and hateful speech in order to find better ways of controlling it rather than just trying to censor it. So Kenneth, um, if I could ask you uh, to do the same sure. thing. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. I am really sorry that I had a conflict this morning so I couldn't uh, participate, but I appreciate Nadine's very concise summary of what I missed. <laughs> and I look forward to watching the recordings you know, uh, diligently in the near future. Um, Kathy kindly sent to those of us in the panel that uh, her presentation, which was fantastic and you will all see shortly, 
um, but with some of her uh, thoughts about it. And I, it got me to really think about that question that you asked about how do we think about counter speech? Because I never really had uh, thought about it as deeply as Kathy did in terms of coming to a definition of it. And thinking about it, I very much agree with Nadine that I look at it as a much broader issue um, than how do we respond directly to speech we don't like or we find harmful or hateful or dangerous. Um, I see it much broader is how do we cultivate an environment in which that speech is less likely to be uttered, less likely to be heard, less likely to be acted upon? How do we create an environment where people who uh, are opposing uh, hate as a, as a political or theological or ideological weapon, how do, how do they structure what they do uh, more generally? Part of this is informed by the fact that I'm old and I remember dealing with these issues before you know, there was a first hate site on the internet in 1995. Um, and, but the same principles apply. I mean, when there was something like a Klan march or some other hateful thing in a community and I was working with communities around the country, my advice to them, you, know, you can't ignore what these folks are saying but your job is not to go tit for tat and let them send the agenda. Your job is to use this as an opportunity for how are you gonna build a structure that makes everybody feel more welcome, makes hate less likely to be heard, marginalizes these things, using free speech, using your own free speech and using your ability to build community. And I see the same principles apply when we're talking about now living in a real world and a virtual world simultaneously. How do we use these tools not to, to go tit for tat with hateful people who are also using these media as much as how do we use it more effectively to create the kind of world that we all would like. Thank you. Um, and our fourth participant um, is Joshua Garland. Uh, Joshua is a mathematician and applied complexity fellow at the Santa Fe Institute. He received his PhD from the University of Colorado, where he developed a new paradigm in delay coordinate reconstruction theory. His research aims to develop rigorous models that bridge the gap between theory and observation. In studying complicated, ill-sampled, noisy systems, his work focuses on understanding how much information is present in the data, how to extract it, to understand it, and to use it, but not overuse it. In October 2020, Joshua and his colleagues presented the first large scale analysis of tens of millions of instances of hate and counter hate on Twitter. Their findings suggest that organized movements to counteract hate speech on social media are more effective than striking out on one's own. He hopes that, I'm freely using a quote here uh, from an interview I found. Um, he hopes that we can come up with a rigorous social theory that tells people how to counter hate in a productive way that's non-polarizing and bring the internet back to a civil discourse. So Joshua, the same question goes to you. Yeah, so thanks for that and thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, the yeah, I kind of think about counter speech in any way to effectively counter hateful rhetoric, um, as well as misinformation online. Um, I don't think it necessarily has to be against hateful rhetoric, but also toxicity such as misinformation. Um, and I think about it as a way to empower citizens to do a task that artificial intelligence is simply not capable of doing. And so the thing that I think is very interesting coming from like an NLP perspective is that um, I don't think that artificial intelligence is up to the chops of countering hate without just censoring it. And it's gonna censor a lot of the wrong things like have been spoken about today. And so I think counter speech is a way to effectively empower citizens to do this really challenging job where you have to know a lot of the nuances about a particular society, about what's going on, about what current decisions are being made by legislators uh, and things like this, that AI is just simply not capable of doing. And so especially when you think about using counter speech to counter things like misinformation, um, you know, current artificial intelligence can't even do fact checking let alone tell if something's slightly misleading, right? So it's like, whether this fact is true or false, AI cannot do that. Um, whether this is a misleading fact, which is mostly true, but 10% false, uh, is way outside of the realm of uh, what AI can do. And so we empower as citizens to come in and counter misinformation through counter speech and things like that. And so those are some of the things that are really exciting for me and I'll get into them uh, a bit in the, um, how I'm talking, but, or, or in my talk in a minute. 
Great, thank you. Um, before we move on to questions and discussion, I would say we I, I hand over to Kathy. Um, if you want to share your slides, feel free to yes. do so. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Can you see that? Can you give me a thumbs up so you can see it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Great. Um, so before I start, I just want to kind of echo what others have said. I uh, have also been listening all day and have found this just such a useful and thought provoking um, day of talks and conversation. So, so thank you to everyone that's been involved and has contributed to the conversation in any way. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the question of effectiveness. You know, when I was sitting down to plan this talk, I was thinking about, you know, there are so many different topics that we could use as an entry point into a conversation to counter speech. Um, and I decided to kind of settle on a question that I've come back to over and over and over again um, in my work in this, in this field. And that's, you know, is counter speech effective? We've been talking about this all day, um, how to make it effective, what, uh, you know, what works best. Um, and it's something that I'm often asked when people hear that I do this work, you know, oh, but does it work? You know, does it work? This is the, the kind of the main question, right, that keeps coming up. Um, now, I, when I first started dealing with this question, I feel like my, my first instinct was to kind of pause, right? And to, to say, well, before we can answer this question, we have to really decide what we mean when we say effective, right? So what do we mean when we say, does it work? What are we actually talking about? Um, and because I'm an anthropologist, uh, my way of kind of approaching that question was to try and find counter speakers, um, watch what they're doing, take part uh, when possible kind of in, in seeing how these exchanges are, are happening um, and talk to lots of people asking them, kind of, what, what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? What does success look like to you? Um, and so that's, that's what I did, right? Um, been with the DSP for, for a few years now. And one of the main projects that's kind of an ongoing project is to, to create this kind of um, international survey looking around the world um, trying to find and document as many counter speech efforts as we can. Obviously, we have not found them all. There are so many people that are doing this at some level. And I should say, you know, um, we hear a lot, we've heard a lot today about counter speech campaigns. I would use that term kind of very, very loosely in, in relation to my work. Some of them are these super well organized campaigns that might have governmental funding or, you know, glossy PR booklets. Um, but some of them are people who have, you know, very different day jobs and come home at night and log into social media and just try and kind of challenge hatred and misinformation when they see it, right? So we're talking kind of the entire scope of, of people and kind of funding capabilities, uh, you know, when, when they're doing this work. So I've, you know, talked to over 50 people who are involved in ca different counter speech efforts. Um, using semi-structured interviews that are, you know, dealing with this question of effectiveness as well as many other things. And then on top of that, um, have completed a really kind of extensive literature review looking at what, what is out there on this question of effectiveness. How are scholars choosing to define that? Where are they, why are they basing, like how are they basing that definition on, how are they making that decision? Um, and that literature review is available on our website if anyone's interested. Um, but so this is kind of all of the background information that's coming into and informing my talk today. Um, there are obviously lots of really interesting findings that have come out of these interviews. Uh, but for today, I'm going to focus on just this piece on kind of goals and how counter speakers define success. Because when looking at those, I think it can really help inform our work as researchers and thinking about like, are we really being, um, are we really kind of taking into in this practice into account when we're designing our work on what makes counter speech effective or whether it is effective. Okay, so let's think about kind of how counter speakers get involved in their counter speech, right? So they will often be online and will come across some piece of speech that they think they should respond to, right? Now, the striking finding that we've made by doing these interviews 
is that many, many people, like the vast majority of people with whom I've spoken say that when they respond, right, they are inspired by a specific piece of speech, right, that they see, but when they craft their response, they are not responding with the intention of reaching this person who posted the, you know, inspiring content. Instead, they're trying to reach, you know, what, what people have called the reading audience or the silent readers, the silent crowd, you know, any of these terms are things that, that get said to me um, in with their speech. They're trying to influence the other people who may encounter that conversation, who may not be participating at all. In some ways, they might even be kind of invisible in these interactions. They're just people who are seeing it when they're scrolling through social media. So this is kind of the overarching goal that we see from most of the counter speakers with whom we've conducted interviews. Um, and I think that within this overarching goal, the counter speakers have provided some really interesting nuanced explanations or kind of sub goals that they're, they're trying to accomplish um, that line up with their own theories of change with counter speech. And so that's what I'm going to kind of devote the rest of the presentation to is just showing you some examples as a way to kind of get at these different um, sub goals for lack of a better term at the moment. Um, okay, so the first example is a campaign called More Than Mean. Uh, this was released a few years ago. I don't know if anyone has seen it, but it was put out by um, a group of people who are kind of uh, in the sports broadcasting, sports journalism field. And they worked with two um, female sports journalists, uh, Sarah Spain and Julie DeCaro, who are just the, you know, the subject of where they receive so much hate mail and really kind of threatening, harassing messages all the time, which is not, you know, uncommon for, for female journalists in general, especially female sports journalists. Um, and what they did was they set up this, uh, they tried to create, or they did create a little viral video clip that um, is composed of men who were invited to take part in what they told them was, it would be like Jimmy Kimmel's mean tweets, right? If anyone's seen that, people kind of reading tweets that are mean uh, and sent to, to famous people. So in here, the men, they're not told kind of the extent uh, of the harassing and threatening language that's in these tweets. And so the video captures them, um, reading them, the tweets start out kind of funny, and then get progressively worse, more hateful, more harmful. Um, and, and the video captures the men's reaction and embarrassment, horror as they're being asked to kind of read these on camera. If anyone hasn't seen it, I would encourage you to go watch it. It's about three minutes, it's very moving. Um, but what's interesting and why this is useful for thinking about the topic of goals and effectiveness is that when I asked the, um, one of the people who's inv involved in designing this project, you know, what is the, the audience? What is the goal for this effort? This is what he said. He said, we were never going to reach the artist of hardcore trolls. The guy who threatens to rape Julie DeCaro isn't someone worth talking to. I wanted to reach the guy who scro scrolls past this stuff, who doesn't think about it, or the sports fan who reads it and piles on, like the last guy in the tackle, right? So we heard this many times. Um, I heard this many times from people with whom I was speaking that in many, many cases, they were not um, targeting the person posting the, the hatred because they said, it's just not, it's not worth our time. As many people have talked about today, counter speech takes time. It's, it's emotionally difficult. It is time consuming. And they're saying kind of the, the chance of success is not great when you're dealing with one person posting something really extreme our time and our effort is better spent other places. Sometimes it's just that very kind of um, practical nature. Sometimes it's conveyed more as in like, that person is not worth my time. I do not want to spend my time talking to someone who calls it, who's a neo-Nazi, right? I don't want to do that. Um, but I think this really captures it, right? We're trying to reach the people who either aren't thinking about this issue and should be because it's there and it's real, or someone who might kind of casually take part thinking that it's funny um, but doesn't realize the impact that it's having on someone. Another reason that people um, offer for speaking to kind of the audience can be kind of exemplified by this uh, counter speech effort. This is a Twitter handle called Yes, You're Racist. This was started by a man named Logan Smith. Uh, he often talks about this as 
you know, around the time that Barack Obama was elected president, he was hearing lots of people say, oh, this is proof that we're a post-racial nation now, that, um, that racism and discrimination don't exist. We're over that, right? And he's saying, of course, that's not true. It's just that some people, because of the way that we are segmented and segregated in society and because of these little bubbles that we have online, aren't seeing it. So one day he went onto Twitter and searched for the phrase, I'm not a racist, but, um, which is inevitably followed by something very racist uh, and was both unsurprised and horrified by how many times people use that exact phrasing. And so he started this Twitter handle, yes, you're racist, and just started retweeting everyone he saw that used that phrasing. Um, now, uh, this became, you know, so the, the Twitter handle itself, yes, you're racist, became a part of the counter speech. And um, as you can see here, his following grew really quickly, over 300,000 followers. Often some of his followers would also kind of pile on um, and counter speak uh, and or shame, depending on the, the response, um, the, the person who he was retweeting. Now, um, one thing, you know, he's trying to reach the audience and the goal that he said was that he's trying to make this speech more visible so that it was undeniable. And this is the, the piece that I was kind of um, hinting at in the last session about amplification. We see several counter speech responses that are like this, where someone is broadcasting the bad speech to a larger audience, which is kind of counterintuitive, right? Normally we think about a responsibility to kind of be working for less hatred. Um, and I think he would say in long term, that is his goal, even if in the short term, that might mean making more um, bad speech or at least more visible. And I think that there's a debate here about like the impact that that has. But, you know, he's he's very clearly, you know, and openly not trying to change the mind or behavior of JJ Smooth here, right? He's very well aware that public shaming is not a great way to kind of win over hearts and minds. He's trying to make this um, visible in a way as a way to educate other people and start a conversation around something that for some communities might seem um, you know, invisible or not present. The, um, the next example, I have four in total. So this is example number three. This is a really fascinating uh, effort called White Nonsense Roundup. Unfortunately, they're not as active now as they were a few years ago. Um, they still exist, but not kind of, yeah, no, they're not as active as they used to be. The, the mission behind this, the, when it was conceived, was that um, there's often so much labor and responsibility placed on people of color to kind of continually explain structural racism and you know, defend themselves and, and other members of their community from racist attacks. And the argument was that they shouldn't be the ones that have to do this counter speech work, right? Can we as white people do that work, that labor, that emotional kind of hardship um, for them? And so it was designed that someone could tag White Nonsense Roundup in a social media thread and kind of invite them into the conversation. And then their volunteers would like do the work, right? So you can see this here, um, you know, na uh, no white nonsense, anyone available, one of your people is going there and they write, we're here, what's up, right? Um, and when you talk to the founders of White Nonsense Roundup, they'll say that their, their goals are kind of twofold, right? Part of it is just that they want to be there to provide support, to be an ally to, to people of color when they have to kind of deal with this constant um, racism online, both by actually doing that work, but also just by being there to stand up against it. They're documenting dissent to these, to these pieces of speech that they don't seem to go unquestioned. And also then um, educating, right? Educating people in the audience who might not be aware of the history of structural racism, right? So this is what um, one of the founders had to say about their kind of audience and their goals. Silence is complicity. If no one says anything and it's just this racist comment left sitting there, what are we supposed to think? That all white people agree with that? So it's important to counter that. Also, if there's someone else silently reading the conversation, they may learn something. It may not be the person who said something problematic. It may be a third party who's reading it and they may learn something or it may plant a seed of thought that will lead to a better understanding. Again, we're speaking right to the audience, not necessarily um, making that, that um, person who said something problematic in their words, right? Um, not, not making them their kind of primary target. Now, the last example that I'll share 
is one that most of you are probably aware of since you're all counter speech uh, researchers and thinkers. Um, it's also one that many of you may have heard me talk about before because I've done a lot of research on this group and writing and, and talking about them. But this is uh, I Am Here, the I Am Here Network. The person you see in the picture here is Mina Dennert. She's the founder of Yagerhar, which is the Swedish version, means I am here. Um, so this was started back in 2016. They're a collective counter speech group. So they organize their counter speech in private Facebook groups. Um, they counter speech, counter speak in the same uh, comment thread and like each other's comments as a way to amplify that counter speech while ideally kind of burying the hatred. Um, it's been very popular. Uh, there are now over 150,000 people involved in one of their 16 groups around the world. Um, now there's actually a group in the United States. That's an update from the last time I think that I gave a talk on, on this subject. Um, so this is something that, that is you know, well known, well studied. The reason why it's useful to think about in terms of effectiveness though, is that this group more than any of the other groups that I have spoken with thinks a lot about how to activate more counter speech. And I was so excited to hear Amalia's presentation this morning and I'll be sending her an email about this, about her research on um, that there's actually, they have you know quantitative evidence now that counter speech can lead to more counter speech, not just more counter speech from a few people, but from a wider variety of people. And this is exactly what um, people in the I am here movement will often tell me that they're trying to make space for conversation. I often in my head imagine them as kind of those superheroes that are holding back the walls, right? As they're all falling in, they're trying to hold back the walls so that other people can come in and introduce you know, other opinions and other kinds of other kinds of counter speech. And I think that's really evident because when you ask many of the members about what success looks like, what would be kind of a metric of success, you know, some of them have told me it's when there are so many other counter speakers as part of the, the comment thread that aren't members of our groups. These groups are really big, but that success would mean that they have made that space um, feel safe enough and helped embolden other people enough to join that conversation as counter speakers as well. So I think when we look at these examples together, they raise some interesting questions for researchers. You know, when we think about effectiveness, how do we operationalize that? How do we test for something like makes a member of the silent reading audience feel like there are allies on their side or makes them feel braver and willing to enter a conversation? How do we, how do we measure whether this counter speech is effective at bringing an issue back into public conversation that many people um, before kind of saw it as either not there or just not super visible. I think these are really tricky questions. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about some of the people on the, uh, in the audience right now that I know I've had conversations with a few of you about like, this is how, how would we do this research and how difficult that is to measure um, an audience as, you know, as many of the counter speakers say, this silent audience, this, this non-participating audience normally. Um, and so how do we as researchers take into these kind of various, various definitions and ways of thinking about uh, effectiveness as we're designing research on the topic? So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. That was a super interesting presentation, and I'm sure we can come back to these questions. Um, I took a screenshot just to be sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I would now, before we go into the discussion, um, ask Joshua um, to maybe share his screen as well. No, come on, a moment. I hope it's going to work. Okay. Yes. Can everybody see that? Yep. Okay, um, great. And so I'm thrilled to be able to talk. I'm, I'm super excited about what um, Kathy's talk was all about because it's something we're currently trying to do is measure effectiveness of these groups. And so that's absolutely a perfect segue. Um, and something that we also have not solved, but we're really keen to. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'd like to share some work we've been doing the last couple of years um, around studying the impact and dynamics of hate and counter speech online. Um, the primary question we're working on is can the spread of hate be countered with counter speech or countered by everyday citizens? 
Um, I'll skip over some of this because I think everybody kind of has a good understanding of this in terms of what is hate speech. Um, one thing is that I like to point out is that we do include spreading harmful stereotypes and misinformation about a group to incite fear as part of being hate speech rather than just uh, sort of a traditional definition. Um, as several people have talked about today, um, you know, one potential solution is just for companies to start censoring or removing this type of content. But there's all sorts of a big plethora of problems with doing this, um, including free speech. And it's really hard. And where do you draw the line and all these different things? And so as everybody in this room is well aware, uh, a promising alternative maybe is counter speech. Um, and so I've kind of already talked about what I mean by counter speech earlier. So I'll kind of gloss over this a little bit. Um, but it's the citizen generate responses to um, hateful content in order to counter it or mitigate its responses. Um, and just like Kathy was talking about, kind of the million dollar question in this arena is, uh, is counter speech an effective method to curb hate online? Um, it's very nuanced, it's very technical, it's super challenging to answer um, and for a variety of reasons. And so, um, first of all, uh, one of the main reasons is that um, measuring effectiveness uh, implies that we can do some form of causal inference on the system. Unfortunately, human society is a vastly complex system subject to innumerable outside influences, like these hidden observers that she's talking about, uh, making any rigorous causal inference a very challenging, if not impossible task. Uh, and even if we could measure effect, there's not just one definition of effectiveness. And so I apologize for echoing a lot of what Kathy said. Apparently, we're giving a very similar talk, but um, you know, I guess that's good in some ways. It kind of reiterates it. Um, and until recently, it's been really difficult to automatically recognize counter speech in online, on, on large online corpora. And there's been a lack of long, large long, longitudinal studies on the discourse dynamics between hate and counter speech. And so um, actually, uh, what we're doing the rest of the talk is focusing on exactly that. So we've done a large scale longitudinal study on the effects of these two things, uh, effects of or the discourse dynamics between hate and counter speech that we'll go over and a system we came up with to automatically recognize counter speech in large online corpora. Um, the way we were able to do this is by leveraging a fairly unique situation in Germany where there was an organized hate group called Reconquista Germanica on the left and an organized counter speech group, Reconquista Internet, um, which coexisted for a period of time. So let me give you a little bit of background on these two groups for those not familiar with German social media. Um, Reconquista Germanica was a highly organized hate group that was active as early as January of 2017. Their primary goal was to destroy public discourse, propagate anti-immigration sentiment, and to promote a radical right party in Germany called the AFD, or the Alternative for Deutschland, uh, during the 2017 German federal elections. RG had military-style organization, which included marching orders of kind of like who to attack, how to attack them, and on what platforms. We can talk more about that if anyone's interested. Um, one of the really great things about this group, however, was that they actually self-identified in many cases. So they placed things like red X's, German flags, um, QFD, which means Quality Filter Deutschland, uh, and other similar badges in their names and bios, making it easy for us to identify them. We also had some info setter information, which allowed us to identify known accounts. So we kind of knew what the most egregious accounts were, and we could start from there. Um, you know, one possible way we could measure the effect of this group would be to look at the results of the 2017 federal election, where indeed the for Deutschland drastically increased the representation of the German government. In this figure, the darker the blue, the more power the AFT held in that region of Germany. So from this measure alone, it may seem that RG was highly effective. However, it's also important to realize that from 2015 on, there's a so-called refugee crisis in Germany, and growing concerns that the influx of immigrants create a lot of anti-refugee sentiment. Fortunately, not everyone shared these anti-refugee beliefs. In direct response to RG was a counter speech group called Reconquista Internet. Uh, which was functional by May of 2018, so much later than Reconquista Germanica, uh, upon the encouragement of Jan Böhrmann, who's this guy in the top left. Um, RI's goal was to spread positive messages, restore civil discourse, and to directly counter the hate being spread by RG, or in other words, to do counter speech against RG. Um, and again, when we study the effect of RI, it's also important to take into account societal context and during that time. By the fall of 2018, three years after the refugee crisis, many people were fed up with the anti-immigration sentiment and many massive rallies such as Angel Bar took place in support of refugees. So this will make quantifying any potential effect or I had quite challenging because of the causal inference. So what if we back up just a little bit? It's perhaps rather than study this from a causal standpoint, a more attractive question is, can we use the situation in Germany to get insight into the potential of the counter speech by studying the discourse dynamics between these two groups? 
To study this question, we broke our analysis into two phases. The first was to build a large-scale classification system to identify both hate and counter-speech in German discourse. And then second, to use the system to study the evolution of political discourse dynamics from 2015 to 2018. For this problem, we collected more than 9 million label instances of hate and counter speech. So this is much larger corpus than, um, than has otherwise been used. Um, these were comprised of known timelines of RG and RI members. While certainly not all the tweets in these timelines are hate or counter speech, we were very careful to select the counts where this was their primary focus. So the most egregious uh, hate counts are the most active uh, counter accounts. Um, to train a classifier, we then split these 9 million tweets in several different balanced training and test sets, where each training set had 500,000 hate and 500,000 counter tweets. We then use these 1 million tweets to then train a classification pipeline comprised of a DocTVAC model or DocTVAC language model coupled with a regularized logistic regression hypothesis function for the classification stage. This allows us to take a tweet and to obtain a probability that that tweet is either hate or counter. Um, as many of you probably know, uh, DocTVAC has many tunable parameters. We did a fairly large parameter sweep across many of these to find which parameters allow for the most accurate labeling of our out-of-sample test set. I don't have time now, but I'm happy to talk about any of this in the Q&A. Um, as is well known, however, searching for the best parameter set is often ill-advised. Instead, one should train multiple classification systems trained on different subsets of the corpora that can then work together to find a final classification of each tweet. That's exactly what we did here. We used an ensemble learning approach for multiple classifiers, which each had a slightly different understanding of the language, examined each tweet, and assigned to it a probability of being hate or counter speech. We then averaged all these probabilities together to obtain a final hate score. We then applied a confidence threshold gamma to obtain a final label. Effectively, this allowed us to allow the classification system to collectively have some level of confidence before labeling a tweet, either hate or counter. And so let's get into that a little bit. And so here's, um, uh, here's we'll kind of go through what I mean by that of, of uh, having confidence. So this system allowed us to achieve accuracy scores that were really quite good compared to similar results in the literature, classifying hate and counter speech scores effectively um, or simultaneously, especially consider when they are balanced at set. So let's take a look at this. So if we look at this line that I've highlighted here, uh, the gamma of 85 means you have to get 85% confident that um, something being hate or counter speech before you're labeled it, label it hate or counter speech. If we do that, we get precision recalls of uh, 0.93, which is very good, 0.94, depending on if you're familiar with this literature, that's um, you know anywhere from 15 to 20% higher than other uh, algorithms are getting. But the issue is that we're only labeling 33% of tweets. And so what we're saying is that for these 33% of tweets, we're super confident that they're either hate or counter speech. And the other 70% we're not. So we're just not going to label them. We're going to abstain from labeling. And it's what this is going to do is as we apply this out of sample conversations, if we do indeed label something as hate or counter speech, we're going to be very confident that it is hate and counter speech, even if we do miss, even if we do leave out some of the hate and counter speech that was available in the data set. Um, I don't know, I'm probably not going to get into all these details, but the chart on the right shows that we also did this with um, human labelers and compared our, the justification of our system against human labels. And we see a pretty good agreement between what humans justify as likely hate speech and likely counter speech and what our system did. Um, and here's a paper at the bottom that kind of goes through a lot of these um, analysis here if you're interested. So the next question is, um, can we use the system to study political discourse dynamics from 2015 to 2018? For the second question, we developed a custom scraper system to crawl Twitter and collect over 200,000 fully resolved conversations that occurred between 2015 and 2018 in response to prominent news outlets, politicians, and journalists. We focused the selection of root nodes around users which we knew were heavily targeted by RG and were defended by RI. And we selected these based on private correspondences with RI. So we knew which were the most active accounts and we knew exactly where kind of the battleground accounts were to go and look for. Um, here we show on the bottom, we show a sample reply tree um, where the root node is the first uh, tweet and then replies to that tweet form branch in the conversation. The video at the bottom right shows the evolution of one such conversation. The collection of this data set gave us a fascinating longitudinal test bed to study the effects of hate and counter speech over time. And as you can see, the kind of the, the network topology of these conversations evolved in really interesting ways. We can do them temporally. We know how they were activated, who responded. What's interesting about this particular conversation is those are two people just going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth across a wide, across this massive tree. I don't know, I feel like they spent all day on this conversation. So anyway, um, so now what we're gonna do is um, to start studying the classification um, system um, is gonna color these trees using the ensemble classification system we just described. So each tweet in the tree or each tweet in the reply tree is examined by the classification system and assigned a score. And this allows us to label all the tweets in these 200,000 conversations being hate, counter, or neutral 
speech. A neutral speech here means that it, we're not confident it was either hate or counter speech, just some other kind of speech. Uh, here so you see some examples of trees, which we have color hate, red for hate, blue for counter, and white for neutral. As you can see, these trees have a quite interesting structure, and the interactions between hate and counter are a lot to unpack. So now, uh, with all the infrastructure in place, now we have this like uh, sampling of discourse dynamics. We have a way to like identify hate, counter, and neutral speech. Uh, what we're interested in now is can we start measuring effectiveness? Again, measuring effectiveness is really hard because of causality, and there's not one definition of effective. So we studied this from many different angles. So uh, different than how uh, Kathy uh, viewed effectiveness, you know, as a mathematician, I just say like, okay, I'm just going to define many, many, many measures of effectiveness and just see aggregately how these measures begin playing out. Uh, because I'm a mathematician, I don't like talking to people, so I'll let her do that. <laughs> um, but for the sake of time, let's just dig into a few of the measures that we've put on this data set. Um, so here, the x-axis is time from 2015 to 2018. The y-axis is the proportion of hate and counter tweets we identified in our conversations over that period. The vertical red bar is the formation of uh, RG, and the vertical blue bar is the formation of RI. The red curve is the proportion of hate speech, and the blue curve is the counter speech. As one might expect, they are very noisy signals, so it seemed to react to very societal events. For example, around the time of the Brussels terrorist attacks, we see a large spike in the proportion of hate speech. Uh, surprisingly, prior to RI, the overall proportion of hate and counter speech is roughly constant, or at least bounces around a relatively constant mean. Even after G, even after RG forms, we don't see a rapid increase or decrease in the proportion of hate speech. So around this region, we don't see a large uh, influx. Interestingly, however, after the formation of RI, we do see a decrease in hate speech and an increase in counter speech until around September of 2018, when things seem to settle into a new steady state. But here, the reduced, we have a reduced proportion of speech being hateful. So this may suggest that organized counter speech had an impact on overall discourse at that time. However, German society is going through a lot of self-examination during this period, and it's challenging to claim a causal relationship here. Uh, in fact, even whether proportion of hate speech is a good measure of effectiveness is debatable as such. We parsed this data set in many other ways as well. Let's just into just one other way we examine the data set. Um, so one such measure we used was the ability for a hateful or a counter tweet to steer the subsequent conversation. And so the way that we did this, for this, imagine you have this conversation, and the ith tweet that appears is hateful. Let's call this the focal tweet, um, which has some hate score as sub h. Uh, we could then look at the average hate score of all the tweets which occurred after the focal tweet, which is defined by this formula, and then the average hate score before the focal tweet defined by this formula. The difference defined by at the bottom Sorry, <laughs> the difference uh, kind of defined at the bottom here uh, would then be uh, a proxy for how much impact the focal tweet had on steering conversations toward either hate, counter, or neutral speech. So you kind of see how people start uh, steering these conversations. And so here's a plot of that. So this is exact that this is that exact calculation on our data set. And here are the results. On the x-axis is again time, and the y-axis is the average focal tweet score. The color of each score is the average distance in the subsequent conversation calculate as I just described using the, this formula. So no surprise that it's quite noisy, but some interesting insights do come out of this. Um, first, we see that extreme speech, so stuff that's really, really focused on hate speech or counter speech, seems to be counterproductive. For example, the most hateful focal tweets, which are not on the, which are on the top of this plot, seem to shift the conversation towards counter. And similarly, extreme counter speech seems to result in the conversation shifting towards more hateful speech. Um, so as you may recall, the proportion of hateful speech after RG, shown here in red, did not seem to change very much, which might suggest RG was not effective. However, um, as this analysis shows, what we see here is that after RG, the discourse dynamic did in fact change. Instead of starting out slightly hateful and drifting towards the counter side of the spectrum, conversations stayed hateful. This can be seen by this region being much wider across the spectrum than the previous section. As a formation of RI, however, we see this shifts back. We see here that the most conversations seem to drift again back towards counter and neutral speech, seen by the darker blue highlighted area. Unfortunately, following this, we see a drastic increase in hate speech. This aligns, however, with several alt-right rallies throughout Germany, including this one in Chemnitz, where neo-Nazis were performing sick heils in the streets, even in front of police officers, which is a felony in Germany. This shows how emboldened these alt-right actors had become during this time. It, for, for example, during this time, uh, Ishbenai Nazi was also trending on German Twitter. So this is perhaps not surprising that we see this shift. Then again, we see another shift at the end of our data set, where conversations again drift away from hate and towards neutral counter speech. This also aligns with general societal trends during this time. People seem to become fed up with this hateful rhetoric 
and there are many counter protests in support of refugees and against radical right propaganda. Um, with this rich of a data set, there's obviously a million things that we could have looked at. I presented just two of the nine measures we looked at in this archive paper, um, which is now hopefully in final review. Um, however, we're sure that there are many more interesting ways to examine this data set um, using the classification pipeline, and I'd love to discuss any ideas anybody may have. Um, thank you for your time, and I'll, uh, I'll pass it over for discussion. Yes, thank you so much, Joshua. Um, that was very interesting. I have like loads of thoughts and questions, but um, I don't want to talk too much. And I would actually like to um, ask the rest of the participants, first of all, of, of the panel, uh, maybe specifically Kenneth and Nadine, if, if you have any initial thoughts, comments, questions, um, either to Kathy or Joshua. I, I thank you both so much for your absolutely fascinating presentations. I have a one general comment and, and one general question, uh, which perhaps other people who have presented today could also comment on. Um, first is many thanks to both of you and everybody else who is trying to marshal data about the actual effectiveness of counter speech. As Stephanie mentioned in her kind introduction, I was really quite, as somebody who is predisposed toward more speech and against censorship, uh, and I have a lot of anecdotal uh, evidence for those conclusions, I was struck by how many other human rights activists in many other countries and international agencies also had a predilection for counter speech. But I was also struck by the complete lack of rigorous evidence, right, about either how effective or ineffective censorship is versus how effective or ineffective counter speech is. So uh, to the best of my knowledge, there still aren't any rigorous studies about um, how effective or ineffective censorship is, but I'm glad if I'm wrong about that, uh, please, I would love to love to learn about it. Um, but I'm very, very happy to see evidence mounting about counter speech. Now, I want to come back to a point I made in response to the question about how do I define hate speech? And that is the, or how do I define counter speech to hate speech? And that is the legal standard here. And I'm going to um, refer specifically to the international standards under United Nations treaties, which have been um, exceeded to by almost every country in the world. So they're unusually important. And they also have been endorsed by the Special Rapporteur for Free Speech at the United Nations as the standard that should be followed by social media companies or other online platforms in their content moderation decisions. And very significantly, these international standards have been relied on consistently by the Facebook Oversight Board, which I've been following very closely. They've now issued 18 decisions, two of which came out just in the last couple of days. Uh, to get to the point, um, the international standards, even under the treaties that expressly require countries to ban hate speech, nonetheless say that any speech restriction uh, of hate speech, among other requirements, must be necessary in order to redress the potential harm, namely causing discrimination, hostility, or violence. Uh, and, um, and the international authorities who have interpreted these, these treaties have said that the necessity standard means that the speech restriction has to be the least restrictive alternative. If there is another alternative for preventing the harm, that other alternative has to be used. Now, so far in the Facebook Oversight Board decisions, um, they have reviewed, I think it was seven cases about hate speech where uh, Facebook had uh, restricted the speech. And in four of those cases, the Oversight Board said, no, the restriction was wrong. And even in the cases that didn't involve hate speech, the vast majority of which the Oversight Board has overturned the restriction, they have consistently said that the restriction was not necessary 
in order to uh, deal with the harm. And in most of these cases, certainly all the hate speech cases, the harm that was feared was discrimination or violence against the group that was the subject of hate speech. So far, the board has not yet taken the further step of saying, well, you know, there's a less restrictive alternative here. Counter speech could have been used. They've just looked at the face of the restriction and said it wasn't necessary. But I can imagine if more data comes out, uh, I know a couple of members of the oversight board in their individual scholarship and activism have expressly advocated counter speech as a prerequisite before the online companies can engage in any kind of speech restriction. So I just want to signal to uh, all of you researchers, if you weren't already aware of it, there's a very important legal and real world um, context in which this research can have very significant impacts. Um, so that's my, my comment. Uh, my second point, as I said, is a question. And this is a question that you triggered in my mind, Kathy, early on this morning when you asked a, a question during the AI session. Um, you asked about the impact of counter speech on the counter speaker, in particular, the potential empowering impact. And I wanted to ask a, a, a subset of that question, which is when the counter speakers are themselves uh, targeted by hate speech or members of the group that is targeted by hate speech. There have been many references here, and I, I share the concern that, you know, we should not put the burden and the responsibility on people who are disparaged or members of their groups. I can certainly see the downside or the potential downside of that. But I'm also really curious about the upside. Again, I've read many anecdotal accounts, nothing systematic, where people say, who are disparaged, say, you know, that's the most empowering thing possible to show to this person who's trying to demean and disparage me that no, your words can't hurt me. I'm stronger than that, I'm above that. So I would be really curious if there's any systematic evidence uh, about this possible empowering positive impact of counter speech by the disparaged person or group. I mean, and, I think my answer is, is kind of, um, it depends on what you mean by systematic evidence. I mean, certainly this is something that I talked about in the digital ethnography that I published last year on the I Am Here movement. Um, where people talked about the idea, and I think this is what, what we forget sometimes, maybe not forget, but um, the, the kind of attacks that counter speakers receive, yes, it's absolutely true. And the more visible they are as individuals, the, the more um, likely I think it is that they get those attacks, right? So some of the, the counter speakers working in groups, like the ones that I've studied, or maybe the ones that Joshua has studied, that group seems to provide some kind of protection from that because they're not a solitary voice that's speaking out, right? There's a group to it. Um, but I also think that many of the people with whom I've spoken, they, even though they maybe weren't getting individual attacks beforehand, they were still really impacted and disheartened um, and felt hopeless because of the kind of speech they were seeing online. This is one of the things I think that was really striking in the interviews I did with members of the Swedish group that there were people that said, you know, all of the comments before I started doing this that I saw seemed toxic, seemed xenophobic. And I felt like Sweden had passed me by. Like it didn't feel, they say like, it didn't feel like my country anymore. I thought that everybody believes this, right? Because there's, there weren't voices that felt kind of brave enough to come in and do it. And so there were already those feelings of, of attack, even if it wasn't a direct attack. Right, there was a feeling of um, disconnection with kind of the, the political body, the community in a way. Um, and then by doing this work and, and more importantly, right, connecting with other people who were also doing it and realizing like, oh wait, I'm not the only person that thinks this, wrong, this is wrong. There are lots of us who think this is wrong. We just weren't speaking out. That like that had this really um, important impact on people. And they said, I, I'm not alone. That phrase, it, it was used so many times when I talked to people, almost everybody said something about no longer being alone and like physically actually not alone because they're doing this work together, but also not alone in this larger sense of we're fighting this together, more of a sense of solidarity. Um, so certainly in the group counter speech, I think that 
um, there is this real um, feeling of empowerment that comes out of it. And many people talked about how they're confident in doing that work outside of this these official kind of online actions, right? That they also speak up for themselves more in person. Um, that, that's certainly where I've seen it kind of most, um, most clear in the empirical evidence. Thank you. Yeah, I think Ken, if you wanted to say something Yeah, as well. yeah, thank you. First, uh, thank you. And I, and I really appreciated both the presentations and I'm you know, inspired by how you guys are dealing with the difficulty of trying to figure out this data. I mean, you know, the audience that's passive and how do you know the effect, um, you know, cause, correlation, all those things. So I, I commend you both for doing that research. I think it's really important for the work that Nadine is doing, that I'm doing, and so many others are doing. And the more data and clear thought we can get on this, the better. I, I, I want to go back to sort of the framing that I put at the beginning in the answer to the question about how do you think of counter speech? Because again, I, I, I think of this as a much wider universe and larger question you know, as I was hearing this back and forth about what's online and how do we deal with it, I was just thinking, how many more hateful tweets would I trade for not for having Trump not said that uh, Mexicans are rapists or that we should uh, lock up you know, or, re or register Muslims? Um, you know, there's so many things that are hateful in the universe uh, that have an impact on all of this. And I think that in some ways, you know, to me, the challenge is how do you think through what's happening in the real world and the virtual world and the connection between the two um, more broadly? And what I said before was that I'm more fascinated by the question, and I've talked to both Kathy and Nadine about this before and sent them things, uh, about not what the bad guys are doing, but how do we use it more effectively? And let me give you one example and one thing that I, uh, I've actually spoken to Kathy and to Nadine about that I'm working on for the center and I'd love to hear any ideas you have. The thing that's the real example is a few years ago, you may remember uh, after Trump was elected, there was going to be a neo-Nazi march in a town in Montana where uh, neo-Nazis had threatened uh, the Jewish community and the human rights community. And um, they were going to show up bringing skinheads, armed. Um, it was a great degree of intimidation, but what the human rights folks there and I and a few others did is we turned that around using um, a counter speech model, basically turning their hateful speech on their head with the, it's been used in other places as well, a project lemonade approach we basically put out through social media and other places asking people to make a pledge for money that would go to things that the neo-nazis would detest um and that would be tied to how long their event went so what did, they ended up not marching but what did this do it created uh to me two other positives one is that there were people that were really concerned about this around the world and rather than just hit a like or whatever on on a social media post they were actually able to do something. And I made the people in the community there recognize that they weren't alone. Kathy's point from before, it, it gave them something concrete. Ah, people care about us. So that's one model that, that's actually worked. The larger thing is, again, another question to me from that same region. Um, back at the time of the last election, um, there, was a, there was a Facebook group that I'm part of because of a friend that lives in that region. And somebody posted in this small Facebook group that she had her Biden lawn signs, this is in North, Northern Idaho, uh, picked up and replaced by a Confederate flag. And the police didn't come and it happened six times. And the only time that came was after the last time her house got uh, vandalized as well. The police finally showed up. So I reach out to her and having spent 25 years working with human rights groups, I knew how to, you know, does she, what does she need? Does she need to know how to help to report to the police? Does she need a uh, group of people virtual and real that could be supportive? There are human rights groups in the area that I knew of, does she want me to contact them? And then the idea is why, why can't we have this more automated on social media? There are things that if you put online, I'm gonna kill myself, it pops up to a suicide prevention uh, site. If you could put in KKK on Facebook, it's gonna bring you to a group that takes out uh, white supremacists from groups. Why can't we you know, figure out a way 
to provide information for people that feel threatened or want more information about hate and so forth and use social media much more effectively rather than just responding uh, when we see something hateful. So that, that's the question I'd love to raise to this group. Can I comment on that real quick? Yes, sure. So, so there are some efforts to do that, that exact thing, kind of. Um, they're called reverse search. And so um, if you search in Facebook, for example, like how to obtain opioids, a lot of times it'll give you the opposite answer. It'll give you how to uh, get off of opioids. Or if you search for how to kill myself, it'll give you suicide hotline as opposed to tactics for killing yourself. And so there's this thing called reverse search from the jigsaw group that's actually being used by um, several different search engines. And it has a lot of uh, um, kind of scary ramifications, right? Because who controls how the search is reversed? And so, for example, um, I have a colleague in Indonesia who's concerned that if the Indonesian government was in control of this and someone searched for homosexuality, then it would give you all the penalties for being a homosexual in their country rather than um, any useful information about that. And, you know, when do we decide that suicide is something that we should reverse search, but homosexuality is not? Not, or abortion rights or not, or many of the other kind of more grayer areas that we see in our society or political ideologies we see in our society. Um, and, and so th that exact thing does exist for sure, um, which is interesting. And I appreciate that. And you know, those, those are significant questions. But what I'm suggesting is that, you know, going back to my model, there were things that this, not to force on this, you know, poor woman that had this situation, but that would provide her the opportunity to see what else is out there, what other questions she um, might not have otherwise thought of. I mean, there, there are tons of groups around the world that work in human rights, that work for free speech, that work for preserving democracy. Um, and, you know, to, to expect people to sort of stumble on them um, yeah. when they might have a need or an interest I, I think is just wasting an opportunity. So I appreciate your, absolutely. I mean, Nadine and I have, have both been very clear that we don't want you know, governments and others to, to you know, control information. It's part of the, one of the major reasons why I'm, I'm such a, a fan of counter speech, even though um, you know, the, the full data that we would all like isn't there because the alternative to censorship is giving the government the ability to control what's, what's said and what's not said. So I, no. I hear you and I'm with you on that. I'm just saying that there may be better ways for people that do need this information to be able to access it through social media and through, through websites and so forth. Yeah, and so Facebook just did some really interesting research actually um, doing A-B testing for this kind of thing where they would isolate people that were at risk for um, a particular, like at risk for being attacked for hate or they're at risk for um, becoming an Islamist extremist. Um, and then they would do A-B testing. So here's a hundred individuals that they think are all kind of apt to be um, radicalized by ISIS. And then what they would do is in the advertising scheme. So, right, so they can't control what people post, but they can control what they advertise. So for half the group, then they would advertise these counter narratives to ISIS and in half the half the group, they would push the ISIS narrative, and they would see, you know, is it more likely or less likely that the people that were seeing the counter narrative are being um, pushed away from ISIS and pushed away from radicalization? And so I can imagine as well, like isolating individuals, just like you're saying, that are at risk for being um, the targets of hate, and then you know, showing them advertisements about like support groups for hate and these kind of things. And I think that's a really phenomenal idea. So it's like kind of one step above what they're doing. And I think it's a really cool way of looking at it. So you and I will email later. Deal. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, if it's okay, I would like to um, maybe move on to some questions that have been posted in the chat. Um, one which has been directed at Joshua. Um, have you been using the hate or counter data set also for qualitative analysis and is the data set with the hate or counter comments publicly available? Yeah, and so uh, we are not doing much qualitative analysis at this point. Um, so we're doing, it's all um, quantitative analysis for us at this point. The two data sets are not publicly available and we're debating whether to make them publicly available. And mostly it's mm -hmm. to, there's so much about releasing hate data sets where it's like the right to be forgotten and these kind of things, especially after three or four years, you start releasing these things. 
Um, and is it our responsibility to clean up the data sets? So for example, if someone went through and deleted all of their hateful comments, then should we do the same thing in our data set or should we just release it? Um, the other concern was the releasing the identity of some of the counter speech people, um, because in Germany in particular, a lot of the counter speech activists were um, doxxed and threatened and their families were threatened. And so keeping their identities um, as kind of secret as possible. And so uh, we're trying to figure out a way now that we can kind of anonymize this data set. It's not reverse searchable um, in a way that would be useful for the community at large to study this. Because we would really, it's, it's this massive data set of hundreds of thousands of conversations and millions of tweets. And we'd really like to get this out to the community and just figuring out a way that we can do that with, while respecting people that have changed their opinion with hate, as well as um, protecting the identity of the people that are doing the counter speech. And it's not as easy as just anonymizing the data set because you can just take, for example, you can just take all of someone's counter speech and reverse Google search it and it'll bring up the person's Twitter account. So it's really hard. You actually have to go through each tweet and reword it in a way that um, gets across the same message, but isn't the same words and isn't close enough that Google can recognize that it's the same tweet. Um, and so it's a really, really challenging problem to anonymize these data sets. And so we're, we're struggling with that a bit at this point. So we're open to suggestions there. Yeah, I absolutely understand that. Um, I think it might be interesting, and I think that's kind of was the point of the, the comment or question. I think it would be interesting to have linguists or, or other uh, researchers look more closely at the um, at the content, I suppose, from a more qualitative perspective. But I totally understand why it's obviously difficult to just make that kind of data yeah, and available. I'll I'll say, well, we're not doing sort of this qualitative analysis. We are doing a lot more work right now looking at the actual strategies being used by each group. Yeah. So doing NLPs to say, like, they're mostly targeting in-group conversations or out-of-group conversations, or they're using humor, or they're using sarcasm, or they're using this tactic or that tactic. So really looking at the linguistic, but looking at the linguistics from uh, an NLP perspective rather than, um, like, someone going through and linguistically labeling all the data. So that'll be a follow-up study, hopefully soon. Sorry? I said that'll be a follow-up study, hopefully soon. <laughs> uh, there was another question, a clarification question, also for you, Joshua. Uh, were you able to track a specific conversation around a focal point on multiple platforms, or was it confined to one platform? For example, a tweet by a public figure that might show up on a screen grab on Reddit. No. so. We would collect the conversations that occurred on Twitter in their entirety, but we would not then try to find it where else it was posted and where else it went to. Um, that just became a little bit too too challenging. And so what we did was just collected all the conversations on Twitter. I think that that's already quite challenging if you have to consider you you need to follow an entire conversation to really make sure um, who is responding to who and where is the actual counter speech and yeah. yeah. It is, but um, Twitter just released in their newest API for academics, an ability to search for an entire conversation using the conversation ID. And so you can ask for, um, you can ask for the conversation that resulted from a particular tweet and it will respond with the entire conversation. And so that is still in its infancy. Like, so we went back and tried to recollect all the conversations that we collected and the vast majority of them were not available yet. Um, but this is a functionality that they're currently building in, so you can actually have the full conversation available. Um, but when we did it, no, we had to write these custom scraper scripts with all this stupid recursion and all this like garbage that we had to do, but we finally got it done. Uh, and so, yeah, it was super challenging. That's, that's true. Um, another question, um, is there any fixed point or stability phenomenon in your modeling? Um, I'm not exactly sure what Nico means by that. Maybe you could elaborate. I mean, I know what fixed points and stability analysis are, but in this context, I'm not sure. I cannot help at all with this, I have to admit. So if Nico uh, wants to elaborate, please do. I mean, I guess the only thing that I would say is that in the proportion of hate and counter speech over time, what was interesting is that you do sort of see a fixed point stable solution that for a long time you see about the same amount of, you see this about the same amount of um, hate speech and the same amount of counter speech. And then what you see is these uh, inflection points where certain events occur that cause spikes in this, but then you see this mean reverting process back to some kind of stable condition. And then what you see after RI or the organized counter group, which we thought was interesting, is 
because you have a new stable fixed point that kind of decreases and then it stabilizes at a new fixed point. And so from that, we did do this fixed point stability analysis, but it's a bit too noisy to do kind of rigorous nonlinear dynamics version of that, which I hope answers Nico's question if he is still here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm sorry to dominate the questions. Sorry about that. Yeah. That is totally fine. Um, I don't know if any of you have uh, any more questions to each other. Um, otherwise, I would ask another question, but um, I'm happy to uh, to let you uh, ask any questions first. Otherwise, I would um, I would like to maybe come back to the um, question of maybe who should perform the counter speech. We've been talking a lot a lot about. Um, the people kind of behind the screen who are doing the work. And um, in, in my project, what we've been thinking about is, could we actually use technology? Could we use AI to kind of automate the process or maybe semi-automate the process? Um, would that be useful from your perspective? Um, and kind of, yeah, who, who should do the job? Should it just be individual users? Should it be experts kind of like taking um, taking care of a wider campaign? Um, or would it actually be useful to have some kind of automated tool um, to help people use counter speech? I, don't, I almost don't want to say effectively, <laughs> but um, yeah. I can jump in. Um, I don't think it would be not useful, right? I don't think that we need counter speech to be just one thing. Um, and I think that, you know, if anything, that's what the, the example is. One of the things I can take away from this kind of big set of examples that we have is that you have lots of people that are involved at some level, each targeting different audiences in different ways. Um, with the idea that some messages land for some people in a, a different way than they do for someone else, right? Um, maybe when we think about kind of these different kind of definitions of effectiveness that I kind of threw out there, is there one, maybe to turn the question back, back to you, is there one way that you imagine an automated counter speech model, like one way that that would work more effectively than something else? Like maybe that is a really good way to, um, to kind of get the, the perfect message to change someone's mind. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's the best way to make, um, make something, like to flood a space with, with counter speech. And maybe a different model um, is better at doing something else. Maybe you need a person, if you're going to kind of develop these kind of long-term bonds and go back and forth and, and change someone's mind. I'm not sure, but I'm curious from your perspective or from others here who are working on on automated counter speech, is there a particular kind of um, goal that, that you see it working toward better than, than another goal, you know, perhaps? And I'd like to piggyback on that because it's a great question, but I'm, I'm curious those who are working in this space, how much they delve into and rely on social psychology and sociology to, to think about this. I mean, what we're really talking about here when you strip it down to its basic is ideas and their capacity to have hold on people, which is much more, you know, it's throughout history before the internet and so forth. So it's the ideas and how do they resonate? How do they get somebody to move in a different place? When there's so many other ways that they get information other than just people speaking on social media. Um, they get it from their family, they get it from their religion, they get it from their political leaders, they get it from, you know, their community. Um, and, the, you know, there, there were books, I mean, there was a book um, that was written basically right about the time that, that Trump was elected, looking at uh, people in Louisiana who theoretically should have not been Tea Party people, but they were. They were people that were living in uh, a bayou country where they hunted and fished historically. That was part of their culture, part of what they were proud of. Pharmaceutical companies were poisoning them. They couldn't fish. Their people were dying of cancer. Yet they still jumped on this Tea Party. Let's not have regulation. It wasn't in their self-interest, but there were lots of identity issues that were driving why they decided to look at the world the way they did. So that seems to me to be an essential part of this puzzle. 
what kind of messages will work for whom and why? How does the, what affects them individually also affect their ability to think as a group from social psychology? And how does that apply with politics? Because at the end of the day, which I was mentioning about you know, Trump before, the fact is that hate always works in politics, otherwise polit politicians wouldn't use it. Um, and that's a big part of the larger tapestry that I think we have to incorporate into our thinking as well. So basically, um, yeah, yeah, Kathy, please. Just the, the only other thought that, I, that came to me while, while Ken was talking is I think the, the, only, um, the only kind of danger in, in having automated responses, again, comes back to this question of authenticity that we touched on yes. um, in this last session is that if, um, you know, I'm imagining, I'm, I'm kind of envisioning a, a, a counter speech AI that becomes really effective, right? And we're using it all the time to kind of counter counter hatred. So maybe this is not a, a super realistic scenario, but if that happens and then all of a sudden it becomes known that this wasn't, these weren't real people, right? Then does that decrease the effectiveness of all the other real people that are trying to do this work? Because mm -hmm. everybody assumes all of it is, is just, uh, they, they feel manipulated by those mm -hmm. kinds of arguments then and reject all of it in kind of a, in the way that we're seeing like anti-science arguments now in the US, right? They, they turn away from everything then that is along that same kind of argument structure. Um, also, I could imagine it being really um, kind of doubly hurtful if someone has been made to feel that they have an ally out there or made to feel that there's mm -hmm. something else, that they're not alone because they've seen this counter speech and then they find out that it was a machine doing it and not another person. Then do you feel like, oh man, they're really, there's no one out there, right? Um, so I, I could see it having that effect, but all of this um, assumes this scenario that is maybe not super likely. Yes. No, I completely understand those uh, concerns. And I think kind of what I would have in mind, I think I mentioned this um, earlier in the second session, um, I think what I would have in mind is kind of like a, a semi automated <laughs> approach that would help people who are maybe observing um, a problematic conversation happening on social media. They want to intervene, but don't really know how to. And I think AI could help in maybe identifying, identifying hate speech or a problematic comment and then making maybe a suggestion to a user as like, how they could respond to something which might be effective. I mean, not saying this is going to be 100% successful and it all depends on how, how great the detection system is. And um, eventually it all, I guess, comes down to having really good data again. Um, but I, I, could, I could see something like that being useful to some people who want to intervene but don't really know how to or what a good, good first starting point would be. I see this as analogous to any kind of communication or indeed any kind of education or advocacy, right? Um, you, uh, for some purposes, looking up something on Wikipedia is fine. For other purposes, you know, a classroom lecture with a thousand students sitting there is fine. But for other kinds of education or communication, you really need a very small group or even sustained one-on-one. -on -one. And I think we have to have, you know, the, the theme throughout has been, it's not one size fits all. It depends on what the context is, including what your goal is, uh, the particular speaker, um, the particular counter speaker. And I think um, what would be helpful is to have an array of alternatives, some of which can be invoked much more cheaply, much more quickly. Uh, but hopefully there would be a, a panoply that would be extremely individualized and, and personalized as well. Yes, Kathy. Another real quick thought on this. I think the other, the other place that it could be really useful, and this could be either kind of what you're proposing with an, an aid to help someone kind of craft a counter speech argument, or even a, a more automated approach is being that first comment. I think that what many of the counter speakers with whom I've spoken have mentioned is like, it's really hard to be that first 
dissenting voice, right? Especially if there are many other voices on the other side, it makes you feel like you're going to get attacked immediately. It also is just hard because um, you have to be really confident that you're right if you're going to be the first person to step outside and, and counter kind of the prevailing wisdom within a space. And so even, um, even having a voice that just says, I don't think this is right. Can someone else jump here? Can be incredibly powerful, right? That's not someone who's citing a bunch of facts or even being super confrontational, just expressing a little bit of doubt that um, against that kind of hateful comment can make someone else feel more confident to jump in um, and they know they're not alone then in that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of similar. It, it makes it more likely that people um, like a counter speech comment, for instance, on, on Twitter or Facebook. Um, and then it kind of kind of starts a domino effect, which, but I think making that initial um, obstacle kind of like become smaller or remove it entirely, I think could be really helpful. All right, um, I think we're, we, we've reached kind of the end of our session. Um, I don't know if any of you have anything that they still want to address, ask, comment. Other than to say thank you to everybody. <laughs> yes, I, I would have done that as well. Likewise, Likewise thank you all. <laughs> yes, um, I also want to thank you all very much. Um, all the participants um, of this session, but also the participants of all the previous sessions, um, especially to those who've been around since uh, the very beginning. And I realized that for some of you, this must have been a very tiring day being up very early. Um, so I greatly appreciate that. Um, thank you all so much for participating. Also want to say thank you to everyone who attended and for asking great questions and participating in the discussion. Um, yeah, I also want to say uh, thank you to my colleagues, Shauna and Marcus, who have uh, also hosted two of the sessions. Um, and also want to say thank you to Yuna Yang, who's been kind of behind the scenes all the time and making sure that everyone, everything for the organization runs smoothly. So um, thanks as well to all of those people.